So good afternoon. My name is Marshall Chin, and on behalf of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics and the Boxball Institute, I'm delighted to invite you to today's session in our series on the ethics of healthcare reform. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I just want to let you be aware of another lecture that you may be interested in. So tomorrow, Beth Lown, who's a physician at the Harvard Medical School and Schwartz Center, will be presenting a lecture in the Buxbaum Institute series entitled, What Does It Take to Be Compassionate in Today's Healthcare Environment? That's here in the same auditorium tomorrow, 5 to 6.30. So we have a, a real treat today that uh, it's my, my pleasure and honor to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Linda Ray Murray. For over 40 years, uh, Dr. Murray has been one of the nation's strongest voices for social justice and issues of human rights and health care. Dr. Murray has uh, a distinguished uh, background. She was educated both at the University of Illinois and the University of Michigan and has had a variety of, of really interesting jobs and, and, and positions. Uh, she practiced occupational medicine in Canada for many years, uh, then headed the residency program in occupational medicine at Meharry Medical College in Nashville and then came back to Chicago and she was a, a bureau chief in the Chicago Department of Public Health uh, during the legendary mayor Harold Washington's uh, reign. Uh, she was a medical director at the Winfield Moody Health Center, which is the health center that cared for patients at uh, Cabrini Green Housing Projects. And since 1997, she's been back in Cook County uh, as the chief medical officer uh, at the Cook County system, which is a large system, as you know, that has three hospitals, many health centers, uh, the county jail, uh, the county public health department, so really a diverse position. I'd also mention, too, that uh, um, uh, two years ago, two, three years ago, uh, Dr. Murray was the president of the American Public Health Association, really being a national voice in public health. Uh, the last time I heard uh, Dr. Murray speak publicly was two years ago when she was the keynote speaker at our Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Finding Answers uh, uh, meeting, and she gave the, the dinner talk. And as you all know, uh, speaking at lunchtime or speaking at dinner is really tough, but she just blew the audience away, and people were just mesmerized for the hour. So it's my, my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Murray to you. Well, I'm glad to be here in my neighborhood to have a discussion with you. I'm really looking forward to hopefully the interaction that we have uh, at the end of these slides. I don't, think, I don't think there's much on these slides that are going to surprise you. I just want to have an opportunity to summarize and think about uh, where we are and where we need to be. Uh, I want to remind us as we start off, though I'm not going to focus on this, if one has a human rights perspective of health, which is a perspective that I adopt, I think it changes entirely the kinds of questions that you ask and the kinds of concerns that you have. Um, this is not the normative way to think about health in this country, and I think that's one of the reasons we're in trouble. So just keep that in the back of your mind. This basic question, which is what I usually focus on when I am focusing my speech on health inequities, is really the fundamental clinical question for both population health and personal health. Um, another way to think about this question is that health and well-being is really the ultimate endpoint for everything humans do. This gives us an end, not in a clinical way, but in a cultural way, why health and what we think and do about health is so critical and important. Today I want to focus on some other questions, not simply why some people are healthy and others not. We know in the United States that we have significant health inequities. I really want to ask some more important questions for us as a nation today. Why is the health and well-being of Americans inferior to that of peer nations? I'm not trying to appeal to national chauvinism here, though most Americans get distressed when they think this is true. Uh, this is true. Um, I really am asking a question, why is a nation like ours, as diverse and rich as it is, performing so poorly and getting poorer by the day when we compare ourselves not to the world, but to peer nations? This is particularly a, a challenge for our youth um, and more importantly, what should we do about it? 
Uh, and I, I'm going to talk about that, and I, I really will be interested in, in your notions. This is just to remind us that for the past several decades in the United States, we as a nation have come together around health plans and health objectives. Now, I must say, most of my clinical friends have no clue what this is, and they don't know what the health objectives are, which may be one problem <laughs> that we have. Uh, but just to remind you that the notion of longer lives and, and, and making progress on preventable diseases, uh, eliminating uh, and narrowing the gap on health disparities and achieving health equity, these are part of our national goals. And so one would ask in a rational way, when we make a policy decision, oh, like let's take cost of living increases from retirees that are public workers, does that help or hinder these objectives? Uh, that's a, an important thing. So let me quickly review the Affordable Care Act. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I know some other people in the series have done it. But let me summarize it from my point of view. I, I want to be clear in the very beginning, this is my most positive slide, that, uh, that this is a major, in the context of the United States, this is a major policy achievement. If it works perfectly, not everything works perfectly. If it works perfectly, 94% of our population would be covered. It's theoretically designed to reduce the deficit. Uh, it will help us leapfrog into a modern IT system. The only thing I disagree with this slide, it, it is not major insurance reforms. We should put minor, little, teeny, 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 teeny insurance reforms. I'll tell you more about that later. I'm not, this is really not a talk about the Affordable Care Act. Um, here are the strategies buried in the Affordable Care Act that are designed to allow us to make these changes. This is a, a way that I think many of my colleagues that work so hard on this act think about it. It's, it's a, an effort to fundamentally restructure the medical care system. And it really calls in their best dreams for inverting the triangle instead of spending so much money on acute care as we do now but really redistribute the resources and, and direction that we want to go in. This is the dream of the Affordable Care Act. Um, in the context of that, this medical center, my medical center, everybody is focused on the triple aim here. Um, that of improving population health, the experience of care for the patient, and decreasing the per capita cost uh, for clients for patients. Um, I am not so happy with this triple aim. Uh, population, health, that is improving the health for a population is not quite the same as public health. It begs the question of which population you're talking about. If you ask me, should patients in an, in an accountable care organization have their health improved? Yes. Is that the same as improving the health of the country? Not necessarily. Um, individual experiences that people may have, you may have the greatest experience with your colonoscopy, especially if they give you enough drugs and you don't remember anything. Uh, that doesn't necessarily translate into equitable outcomes. And this, I think, is the most important thing. A decrease in per capita health system expenses doesn't mean you're saving money. In fact, in order to get people healthy in this country, I think we need a better investment. But in any case, so the Affordable Care Act has buried in it a number of reforms that well-meaning people in health care, interested in patient quality, patient experience, and eliminating disparities have sort of put in there. Um, you can see, uh, I think, that we'll have trouble carrying them out. But there, there are things in there about diversity, cultural respect, community health workers uh, trying to address the social determinants of health. All of those good things are buried in the Affordable Care Act in some measure or other. I want to end my talk about that with this slide. When we sent that young man off to Washington, we had him appropriately trained. He understood that single payer was a minor reform that we absolutely needed. Um, and uh, I don't know why we didn't try a single payer. Um, so we can talk about the Affordable Care Act more in the, in the discussion. This is where we are with our uninsured rates around the country. Just pay attention to the southern and part of the country especially. This is where we are where Medicaid expansion 
is occurring and not occurring. The same parts of the country with highest rates of unemployment are refusing to expand Medicaid coverage. Uh, this is where we are with the state market exchanges. Uh, most of the states, uh, what, almost half, are in federally facilitated exchanges. Uh, this is one of the big problems they're having, and you can see the few that are state-based. Illinois, of course, is a hybrid partnership. And this is Medicaid eligibility for childless adults as of uh, January, and again, you can see the same parts of the country with no coverage, with highest rates of uninsured have no coverage for childless adults. This has created this absurd situation, not in Illinois, but in many parts of the country, where people are falling into the gap. They are too poor to get on the exchange and, and buy insurance on the marketplace exchange, and they are too rich or not eligible in their states to have Medicaid. So um, that's going to total right now about 4.8, almost 5 million people. We'll have to see as this rolls out what, what that means for the future. So right away, we've unintentionally created an additional new 5 million people without uh, uh, insurance, unless they happen to accidentally have it on, on their job. Um, here we, it's where we are in Cook County. So if the Affordable Care Act works perfectly, and everybody in Cook County that people want to pay insurance, for, now, let me stop there for, I'm sorry, you know, I wasn't, if, how many of you know somebody that's like 25 to 35 years old? A lot of you, right? And how many people think that those people will just gladly, as what do they say, pay your, pay your cell phone bill again? That's, what, that's the word. This insurance premium, they claim, is just like having a cell phone bill. Most young people I know have trouble paying their cell phone bill, and when they pay their cell phone bill, they actually get something in exchange for it, as opposed to having an insurance plan that hopefully you won't use. So, but at the best case scenario, it'll decrease uh, the uninsured by about 43% in the county, in our county. Uh, still, over 10% of our population will have no insurance, and we should ask ourselves, where are those people uh, going. I want to spend a lot of time on this. this is, these are some uh, uh, surveys from uh, Robert Wood Johnson and Kaiser just pointing out that most Americans are not as dumb as the people in Congress. That's really all these slides show. And mo <laughs> what? <laughs> that's not, that's faint praise. And most of them do not want to cut, have major cuts in public education and Medicare. Uh, they actually think, even Republicans, that Medicaid should be expanded. Um, they don't think that uh, uh, we should let the drug companies get away by uh, charging more uh, in the plan, as is presently the case. So when you do these surveys, most Americans, whatever their political stripes, really have a much more reasonable common sense approach when it comes to what we should do about people's health uh, and medical insurance. What I want to talk today about mostly is where we stand in the country and how most of the world thinks about health and these issues. This is Nancy Krieger's socioeconomic theory about uh, how health is determined. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on it. It's a nice, complicated diagram. It's a, it's a model that I prefer. We'll spend a little bit more time later on in some of the World Health Organization's approach. But the point is that health is a complicated outcome. If, in fact, you believe, as I do, that health and well-being is in fact the major outcome for any human being and group of human beings, then obviously we have lots of things that generate and create people's health status. Um, the three things that Nancy is pointing out, class inequality and class differences, racial and ethnic inequalities, uh, and gender inequalities, this is a diagram for the United States, become critical with how we determine how resources are distributed in this country. We have to pay attention to the history of any group of people that we're talking about, the impact of life course, and obviously our complicated ecosystem, whether it's from the neighborhood that you live in, to what state that you happen to live in, uh, to where we are in global health policies. So clearly, uh, being poor in Texas is very different than being poor in Illinois. Um, and, and just those two geographies make a difference on whether you have medical insurance or not. So let's look at some of this basic data. Um, this is a picture just of life expectancy at birth for 
21 or 22 uh, rich peer countries. Um, and the little red dot um, here are where the United States is in that little pantherum of dots. So you can see in 1980, for both men and women, we were sort of in the middle. And now, in the latest figures, we're at the bottom in both pictures. Uh, this is just one uh, example from the IOM study. We'll look at a few others. The IOM study, which if you haven't read, you should really get it. Uh, it you know, IOM studies are free on the web. You can get them as PDFs. This came out in, in uh, January, last January. Um, when you parse the data carefully, when you take out all of us poor black people and Latinos and immigrants, and you only look at white, non-Hispanics that make money, uh, it doesn't change very much. Here's another way to think about this. How far behind are we, the peer countries? This 35Q15 number is really the probability that someone will die between the ages of 30, 15 and 35. And actually, let me just say, it's in that age range that we've been seeing increased mortality rates in the United States, especially in the southern United States. So the picture on your left is just looking sort of totally. Um, and that graph is showing that basically we're about 40 years behind the average peer country today and 50 years behind the leading nations in the world. Uh, and this differs by age group. So the diagram on the right is really breaking down, this is for women, both of these pictures are for women, uh, breaking down women's ages. And you can see just by looking at the graph that the biggest gap is in that major youth, young, working people. We do not as badly when we look at our elderly compared to other elderlies. So why is this? Well, we, I don't want to pretend that the IOM study, like I said, looks, stratifies the data a bunch of ways and finds that we do poorly even for upper middle class white people in the United States. That the health status of upper middle class white Americans is worse than that of upper middle class white Germans or French or even the British. Um, but I don't want to pretend that race and class are unimportant, especially in the United States. This is data, of course, from the Chicago area, uh, just to remind us that um, the dual impact of being poor and living in a poor community cannot be overestimated. This pyramid shows how many, for all black children, not just poor black children, I took out those slides because I wanted to make sure we had time to talk. This is all black children compared to poor white children. Um, so 25% of all black children live in very, very poor communities. Uh, I'm sorry, 25% live in communities where there is not a lot of poverty, zero to 10%. Most poor white children, almost 75%, live in communities that are not poor. What does this mean in English? This means that you might have a library in your community. You might have a playground in your community. You might have a swimming pool in your community. You might have a decent school in your community. So the impact of racial segregation and concurrent with poverty has a profound impact on the health picture of Americans. Here's another look just at racial segregation in Cook County. This is from a, a study that uh, we did in our Place Matters team with the Joint Center um, uh, about a year ago. And uh, the details aren't important. Just notice that you have blotches of purple and blotches of yellow and blotches of, we're still a very segregated uh, district and, and region. Here's life expectancy by uh, census tract for the Chicago area with the darker census tracts having, the darker colors having the lowest uh, life expectancy. What's really disturbing about this kind of picture, again, not a surprise, I don't think, it's just local data, is that when we take all the census tracts and stratify them by uh, median income, we find these kind of gaps uh, in terms of the average life expectancy for our region uh, compared to the best. So this kind of information, however we do it, is not a surprise to anyone. It should not be a surprise to anyone in this room. We could spend time looking at diabetes or hypertension or stroke or any number of other very specific diseases, and the patterns we would see would be very similar. So the negative effects, again, of segregation on health and human development is something that we have not overcome in this country yet, and it concentrates 
uh, the bad impact of both of these things. You have to consider class and race in the United States. Um, however, when we concentrate and think about health disparities or health inequities, we frequently think about it as haves and have nots. So it's very easy to you know, go a few miles west and look at Inglewood and talk about the bad situation there, or go on the west side you know, and look at uh, North Lawndale and consider the unfortunate things, or go further north and look at Hermosa and wonder about new immigrants uh, from Mexico and Guatemala. And that, those are important numbers. Uh, and I certainly have spent my career working with those populations. What we fail to do is communicate to the American folks that if they live on the Gold Coast, they have better health than perhaps a professor at the University of Chicago, upper middle class professor. And if you have a good working class job, you have worse health than the University of Chicago professor, but maybe better health than the low wage service worker. There is a ladder of health outcomes. This is not simply a have and have not question. Everyone in this room, our health is determined not simply by what we personally do, though that obviously has influence, but where we stand in this complex mix of power and resources. So it's not like you have a certain amount and you're healthy, and we just have to get everybody up to that level. In this country especially, we have a widening inequality going on. And so everyone has a game, it has something in the game of getting rid of health inequalities. It's not like we get rid of health inequalities and we'll help those poor people, those poor others. It's that if we address health inequalities in this country, we end up with a better nation. And in fact, everybody's health, even the health of the richest, um, improve. So I don't care what we look at, whether we look at foreclosures, whether we look at edu college education graduation, whether we look at high school graduation, we see this kind of outcome happening to people based on class and race. Foreclosures have happened all over, all over the region, as you can see from this graph. But this is adjusted for how many mortgages are there. Some communities are hurt worse than others. Some neighborhoods bounce back from the uh, housing market collapse faster than others. And it's not done by chance. It's not done randomly. One of the real challenges we have as health professionals is to widen our notion of what we need to be tracking. It's not simply a question of if you happen to have your house foreclosed on and you're a teenager in that house, maybe your grades go down, yes. It's also a question of how many foreclosed houses you have on your block. That may impact how much illegal activity you have on your block. How, what's your chance of getting mugged on your way to the bus station? When we think about our health information exchanges, for example, we shouldn't be just thinking about exchanging MRI reports. That would be a blessing if that happened. We should really be asking ourselves, what's the unemployment rate on the blocks where my patient lives? How many home renovations are going on on that block? What's the foreclosure rate on that block? What's the assault rate on that block? There's so many other things that we now have an ability to really look at in these small areas that can influence not only what we do as a group with a population of patients, but even what we do with individual patients. So this is the report that I want you to look at, and I, I want to um, <coughs> trying to summarize in an honest way what they said. First of all, this is a typical IOM report. So they don't say any conclusions, right? They just say, we need more study. And we, but it's a very thoughtful and very wonderful report. You should read it. It's easy to read. Um, and again, what they did is take the obvious hypothesis that you and I would generate here in this group and say, is this why we're doing worse? And they start off with, is it because we're a diverse country and we have all these poor, dark people that are sick? Now, that is an assumption that Europe doesn't, you know, that we're the only country like that, which is not true. But like I said, they stratify the data and they say, no, however you compare Americans, you get we're at the bottom of the pile in terms of our health. And we weren't always there. 
1980, 1970, we were near the top in some of these measures, or at least in the middle. So between 1975 and 80 and today, we've gone steadily downhill. We have shorter lives and more morbidity at almost every age. We do the best, like I said, with our seniors, uh, but particularly our young people uh, are, are, gen are in trouble. And that the health inequity that exists in our country is not a bimodal phenomenon. It's, it's, it's a phenomenon that crosses all ages. These are the things uh, that they summarize. I hesitate to call them conclusions. They say, of course, our public and medical systems have important shortcomings. And they talk about the lack of insurance, the lack of access to medical care. The, they don't talk that much, but they do mention the public health infrastructure being weaker in this country. Um, public policy being different on so many issues. Um, but they argue this can't explain all the gap that exists between Americans' health outcomes and the rest of the world. They talk about uh, life uh, behavioral choices. Uh, they point out that the choices one makes is limited and confined by what socioeconomic status you find yourself in. You won't be going out for a morning jog in many neighborhoods in Chicago uh, just because it's healthy. If you do, you'll be in trouble. Um, and they argue that behavior has to be considered in the context of policy and culture. But still, they say, that doesn't explain everything. That can't explain all of these gaps. They dismiss the issue of being uh, confined to minorities and poor and uneducated. That they prove sort of beyond a doubt. And they point out that our internal inequalities have been increasing at the same time that our international rating with peer countries has gotten worse. So we have to stop here and ask ourselves, how many Americans are aware of the fact that we have horrible health compared to other industrialized countries? How many physicians and nurses and pharmacists and health policy people are aware of this is not new. It's not a surprise. It's been developing over the past 20, 25 years. When we consider the Affordable Care Act or other efforts to improve the health system in the United States, the medical care system in the United States, how often do we ask ourselves, will that bring us closer or farther away from our peer countries? I think one of the real sad commentaries about this report is that most Americans don't know about the report, and if they did, they would be shocked, and a great many would refuse to believe it. Because after all, we're the best country in the world. We have the best medical system in the world. You've heard this before, right? Who wouldn't want to be here? So one panel member, this is not in the report, one panel, one appropriate scholarly panel member summarized it as the above. That the reason we're in this fix is that we're a culture that values individualism, individual freedom, and survival of the most fortunate over social solidarity. When we think about what we have to do in this country to address policy issues and change structures that determine people's health. I wanna, I wanna be clear about my language here. I'm not talking about things that influence people's health or encourage people to be, I'm talking about what determines how healthy you are. If you're unemployed, there's a limit to how healthy you can be, okay? Your employment status helps determine your health. Your education level what neighborhood you live in. All of these things function. They function everywhere in this manner. People's health is determined by those conditions. It's not an accident. We can individually move a little bit here or there as individuals, but basically our health is determined by a whole range of factors. Another uh, uh, lecturer giving a report on, on this uh, committee's important work said that I can't remember whether it was, is it New Hampshire or Vermont? New Hampshire, live free or die. So she said, in the United States, we really have live free and die. If we continue to live with our perverted notion of what freedom is, then we will continue to die. 
And, and, and that's a, that's a, so what does that mean in English? Let, let's think about that. Here are some basic functions in healthcare, again, that does not get addressed. I would argue the Affordable Care Act just barely mentions it. And every time you look around, the Republicans take whatever little money was in the Affordable Care Act to address public health. This is a, this is a structure for public health that comes from, in this case, uh, British Columbia in the north, our northern neighbor. But we simply do not, we don't structure our education this way, we don't structure our resources this way, we don't structure our systems this way. Um, so we don't spend a lot of time on health improvement. You know, we don't, ha we, the first thing we get rid of in schools is gym, and then we wonder why there's an obesity epidemic, okay? Um, we, we make it difficult for people to walk, to get anything. If you live in the suburbs, you've got to get in a car and spend a lot of money on gas to get to your local drugstore to get a paper. We don't really focus on disease prevention, especially those activities that are beyond clinical prevention. We pay very little attention to environmental health. We act as though it has no Im impact on us. So this kind of structure, which the Canadians think about public health in, we don't think about it in this country. You see this thing in the middle, population inequality lens. When I was practicing medicine in Canada, you know, people often ask me, what was different? I'm telling you, the thing that was different up there were the doctors. So my clinical colleagues in the Canadian Medical Association, when we would be at a meeting and an issue would come up, they knew right away when public health was supposed to be involved. And they would immediately say, would say, well, you know, Linda, that's something, that's what we have public health for in the government. They should be keeping track of the quality of our mammograms and make sure that everybody's doing a good job and figure out the best. So they had a perception, Canadian physicians, of the role of governmental public health and how critical it was to their practice. And their attitude was, we can't practice good clinical medicine if we don't have a good public health system in, in the province. And they could verbalize that. Uh, how many physicians in this country even know where their local public health department is? Here's some other models. We're going to talk about them just because they go into more detail than Nancy's in a couple of areas that I want to pay attention to before we get into the policy discussions. Um, the WHO models uh, come from several years' work led by Sir Michael Merrimont. Um, to produce uh, that important uh, report on health equity uh, that came out in 2008. Um, and again, this is just sort of their concept of structural determinants of health inequalities and intermediate determinants of health. We spend almost all of our time on the intermediate uh, determinants. But how a nation is governed, um, what, the, what the economic policies, you know, do you have a stimulus package or not? Uh, do you create jobs or not? These are important issues, but the decisions of those debates impact people's health. Now, I'm not sure where, I'm sure our politics are all over the place in this room, but be very clear that when a decision is made, we're going to have shovel-ready products or we're not going to have shovel-ready projects, that impacts people's health. And you can track uh, where people's health are impacted. Do we have unemployment insurance or not? It's not an accident that even in the United States, when the economy goes down, we tend to extend the number of weeks people can get unemployment insurance. What's our policy on education? We know how profoundly education impacts not only people's behavioral lifestyle choices, but their actual health outcomes in later life. So what happens when, for every 100 black boys that start kindergarten in Inglewood, three, three have a bachelor's degree by the age 25. Or if you're investing in prisons in this country and you want to know what communities to build your prisons in, you just look at the neighborhoods where the kids can't read by the third grade and you know what communities to build your prisons in. These decisions impact profoundly people's health. Race, class, and gender, we've already talked about. And so ask yourself, while I fully support having case managers help my patients navigate the horrible travails of ordinary life, 
Is that really the way you're going to improve people's health? Or do you have to do some investment at the front end? And so how we distribute, how we control and distribute these resources decide who's healthier, who's not healthy, and what's going on. And what we need to ask ourselves, and I would argue here, one of the reasons that we lag behind is because we're out of step from the rest of the world with our worldview of what makes people healthy and what makes countries run. I didn't have this graph in, but let me tell you about it. There's a graph that's a, it's, a, it's an interesting ecological graph. It graphs how many people in a country think rich people got rich by luck? You know, they had rich parents, you know, as opposed to hard work. Well, they all cluster mostly by luck. We're an outlier. Most Americans think rich people got rich because they deserve to get rich. They worked hard, they deserve to get rich, even though that's patently wrong. Most rich people today are rich because their parents or their grandparents might have worked hard and got rich. I don't know. And, you know. And, and that's related to how much money we spend on our children. How much money do we spend on people's education, on social supports for children? Forget about the no account parents that don't work, just on children. So there's a relationship in this country about how we think the world works and how the rest of the world thinks it works. Americans are so afraid of spending a dime on an alcoholic that doesn't deserve it that they'll keep dollars away from millions of kids that clearly haven't done anything and deserve to eat. So unless we're willing to begin to come to grips with how we really think people stay healthy, we're not going to make progress. This is the WHO approach. I'm going to break it down in English in a minute about where you intervene on a policy level. And one of the interesting things, you know, we were fortunate, uh, uh, Sir Michael has been in the United States for a couple of months. He spent, he gave a talk at the AMA uh, a few months ago, and he was at APHA uh, last month talking about what's happened in the five years since the WHO report on health equity. Um, and it's fascinating when you talk to him, and what he argues is that, obviously not everywhere, but all over the world, from the poorest countries to the richest countries, people have actually started to address what the WHO recommended in order to decrease the health inequities that exist in their country. And so even rich countries whose health inequities were relatively narrow have, have programs to address it, and obviously other countries um, were with wider gaps have done it. Um, and what the WHO says is first, government is critical to doing anything about the health of a population. In fact, you could argue, except for going to war, that is the fundamental purpose of government, is to protect and keep healthy its population. Um, and secondly, that all the sectors in society have to come together and work together, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce, or transportation, or the education sector, the sports sector, every component of society has to come together and say, we all have a goal of making our population healthier. And finally, let me just say, because this is so critical for Americans, good action by itself will not address health inequities. As a matter of fact, what frequently happens is when you do something good, the health inequities increase. Breast cancer survival uh, is one of those examples. We've made major strides in treating breast cancer, but the gap, the inequities in breast cancer mortality rates between black and white women has increased, in large part because women with better education, better health insurance, were able to take advantages of those uh, advances, technological advances, whereas poor women and, and women of color were not. So we have to consciously and deliberately have policies that we measure against social justice and that we uh, pay attention to health equity. So let me summarize so that we can tee up for our discussion the policy initiatives that I think are obvious um, from our understanding of international health uh, issues. The role of governmental public health is good. That doesn't mean that you, that you have to give up on a capitalist even though I, I, you know, I'm not a capitalist. But I, I'd like to give up on it, but I'm not arguing that you have to give up on capitalism to think that the role of governmental health is important. 
Um, this really represents an expression of political will. They have the, we do have police power to coordinate across sectors, not just when there's a pandemic of some sort, but in normal times. And, and we should, as a public policy discussion process, ask ourselves what needs to be regulated, what needs to not be regulated, how should we regulate the insurance companies, what should we do? Here's some things that we could think about as we go forward in the next decade or so. We have to define priority populations not simply by what costs more. That's what any good HMO managed care group does now because they're looking at their small bottom line. Okay. We need to look broader than that. And so it may very well be that the thing that has the biggest impact on decreasing medical care costs in 25 years might not be more social workers managing our asthmatics. I'm not against that. It might actually be universal preschool. That actually may have a bigger impact. Um, health equity has to be an expressive, uh, clear priority. We have to strengthen the capacity of our state and local health departments. Since the recession in 2007, we have lost 20% of all public health workers working in local health departments. 20% because of layoffs, furloughs. And we have to remember that population health indicators are not the same as individual health indicators, and they don't just automatically sum up. When we think about savings that we assume will happen under the Affordable Care Act or might happen in a, in a managed care organization, we have to ask ourselves, where should those savings be invested? The purpose of savings is not just because we don't want to spend money on people. If that's the case, you can hang it up. The real purpose is so that we can invest it in other things, both in the medical system uh, that are infrastructure, IT infrastructure, but also in our workforce, the public, the, the healthcare workforce. Uh, what health professions do we need for the next 50 years? And how should they be distributed? And how should they be trained? What do we need in a rural community versus what happens in an urban setting? What can we learn from around the country? So the WHO says there are three basic principles that determines the health of a population, improving daily living conditions, tackling the inequitable distribution of power, money, and resources, and then keeping track of the problem. And let me stop here. You know, I probably shouldn't say this on the evening news, but I will say this. The Republicans are right. If you have real health reform, medical care system reform, you really are redistributing resources. You really are. And you want to do that if you want your population to be healthy. You know, so so we, have to, we have to really learn how to engage the debate where it needs to be. We have to ask, what's wrong with redistributing resources so you don't have babies that die? Well, what's wrong with that? So here are some of the basic policy things that we have to consider as health professionals in the United States. Where are we going, when and where are we going to speak up on income supports and progressive family policy? Even something as basic, which is a major campaign for NACHO, our National Association of Community and City Health Officers, mandatory sick days. We just, we just finished an pan, influenza pandemic, a worldwide pandemic. And we told people all kinds of stupid things, cover your cough, you know, wash your hands, we, you know, get a flu shot. Um, but we didn't do basic stuff like, Everybody in this country should have paid sick days so that if you get the flu, you don't come to work and give it to all your coworkers. How about that for a basic epidemiological intervention? Okay. Where were the health physicians and nurses and pharmacists when our mayor closed however many schools he ended up closing, 49 schools? We have to speak up. If we had spoken up 20 years ago when they cut out gym and sports and recreation and music, we would be in better shape today. And we wouldn't have an epidemic, perhaps, of type 2 diabetes among our teens. But what do we think is going to happen in 15 or 20 years with the chaos that's going on, not only in our schools and in many school systems around the country? We need to speak up. We don't all have to agree, but we have to speak up because those decisions impact health. We have to demand good education policies, not only for children, but for adults 
uh, for, um, for lifelong learning. We have to worry about employment and working conditions. We should be speaking up for a livable wage. Do we really think that someone should go to work eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, all year, and earn poverty level wages? Do we think that's a reasonable thing in our country? If we do, we'll continue to see these kinds of health outcomes where we continue to fall below other nations, even other nations that are poor. In Canada, when you're unemployed, it's not considered your fault. You don't lose your health insurance. Okay. So we have to address our big policy questions. Housing is critical. The state of Illinois is preparing a 1115 waiver now. And uh, in that waiver, they're going to ask for permission from the federal government, from CMS, to support housing. Because if you have a population of disabled people or homeless people and they continue to live in the street, your health costs are going to always be there. If you can invest a little bit of that money in sustainable, high quality housing, you will decrease some of your medical costs. We have to look at income and income distribution. We have to look at taxation policy, wages, pensions. You know, it's interesting how we think about it as we listen to the news today as they stole a bunch of money from state workers' pensions. And we act like it's a crime that a teacher would retire and not live in poverty. You know, one of the things that I found striking about what Michael Merrimont said is that in their European report, their position was not only should pensioners have food, clothing, and shelter, and health care. They should be able to go on a holiday, and they should be able to buy gifts for their grandchildren as a basic human minimum. So I'm a grandparent. I said, yeah, that's right. What grandparent shouldn't be able to buy gifts for their grandchildren just because they have a state of Illinois pension? We have to address the issue of racism in this country. If we don't do that and we haven't done it, then we'll continue to be mired in things that don't make sense. And we have to be willing to spend money on what we call in the United States a social safety net. When we look at food and food security, I'm not, you know, now we're going to lose all the Dominics at once, so I guess we'll have a lot more food deserts. I'm not so much interested in the food deserts as I am in what's in the stores and what those people are getting paid and what do the people that get paid that put the food in the store. It's not an accident in this country that agricultural workers, for example, and domestic workers were excluded from Social Security in the beginning or from health and safety regulations. Those positions and jobs have always been marginalized. So we need to build a food system where all along the chain, people can afford to buy the food that they serve us. We've talked a lot about health services. There, I wish we were in a rational nation where we could spend all our time talking about how to transform how we practice medicine. That's really a fascinating and important discussion. Uh, but we won't be able to really spend much time on it if we ignore these other things. So I, I really encourage you as we move into this exciting time where we're experimenting with all different kinds of models of care to understand that we can't change the models of medical care in a vacuum. We have to also pay attention to the things outside of the exam room and outside of our offices. We really have to begin to think not only about our population of diabetics or hypertensives, but the communities in which they live. So when I mentioned to someone my title for this talk, One Step Forward, Two Steps Back, the young person remembered this lyric from Johnny Winter um, from a song, I think, in the 90s. I, of course, was thinking of uh, Lenin's uh, famous treaty on, on uh, problems within the party. And uh, we are a rich, diverse, an innovative nation where things are changing fast. But if those of us with training and health are not willing to speak up, even in areas where we are not experts, and make a link between that community, whether it's where the bus line stops, what time the bus stops running, where the playgrounds are placed, what communities have silos. If we're not willing to make links with what goes on in people's daily lives, with what we know to be the case about human health, then we're doing a disservice to our training 
and we'll be guaranteeing that even when we go one step forward, in fact, we'll be going two steps back. And I want to close with one of my favorite quotes from Dr. King, who said, rarely do we find men who are willing to engage in hard, solid thinking. There is an almost universal quest for easy answers and half-baked solutions. Nothing pains some people more than having to think. We have to think together. We have to speak up and encourage our neighbors and colleagues to think. We're a nation in trouble where we've allowed the fourth largest city, Detroit, to go into bankruptcy, where we haven't built New Orleans, where we're allowing the elderly to have their future unstable, and we're not investing in our youth. We need to say, time out, what exactly are we doing? And what do we have in common as human beings in this nation that we can come together and improve for everybody? Like I said in the beginning, this is not a question of the poor and the rest of us, or the dark and the rest of us. It's really a question as it has always been about all of us. Thank you. Dr. Murray will take questions. Uh, while people are thinking, I'll start off uh, with one question. I think probably a lot of people will see here and say, well, you know, um, you have merit with uh, much of what you say, mm -hmm. but these seem to be large issues that go beyond any of us. So what are the specific asks you have or what people here can do, as well as like academic centers or hospitals will say, well, yeah, we think that's a problem, but it's not our responsibility. What is the responsibility of people here, as well as like the hospitals in this city? Well, first, I think, that I, I think that it's so easy for all of us to feel overwhelmed and discouraged by all of this stuff. That's a perfectly normal and natural feeling. So, so I don't really expect people to all suddenly become Dr. King overnight. <laughs> um, and I, I think that we underestimate the power that we do have, and especially those of us that are in healthcare. Uh, we underestimate the influence and power that we have, and, and most people in this room are relatively privileged. We, we know that, some more privileged than others. So to that question, I usually have two kinds of things to say. I say, first, have some historical perspective. It was not politically feasible to end slavery. You know, it wasn't politically feasible. But we did end it. And I personally am grateful. So these problems, it wasn't politically feasible to end Jim Crow or to end the war in Vietnam. These are things that were considered unapproachable in historical time. And there are plenty of others in all kinds of nations and all kinds of historical epochs. So what I would say is that our first obligation, certainly as health care people, is to see and talk about the link between people's health and issues and problems of the day, which is sort of begs the question of what we personally do, but if, at least if you make the link. So if teachers are better aware or parents are, are more clearly aware of the impact of losing this particular program or that particular program on the health of the children in that school, then that gives them something to argue with and ammunition to fight with. So that's, that's the least we can do. That's so easy for those of us, especially in academic settings, where that's what we do pontificate anyway, right? That's what we tell people this is how it works. So if we just did that in, in a real way, this data that I presented, if we started talking about that everywhere, again, this is not, this is, this is not new information. If we made it obvious to people that our nation is not the healthiest nation in the world. And it's not just because we like McDonald's. Um, so all of those things are simple. Uh, now, the more difficult things. I think that everyone, wherever they are, whether you're a school teacher, whether you're a bus driver, in our case, whether we work in healthcare, where we're investing a lot of money in changing how our, how our medical and healthcare system works, if in those settings we fight for things that we know will have an impact. So think about it. Ask yourself, uh, I, don't know, is, is, I don't know if the university, if the hospital is going to participate in the health information exchange. Do, do you, anyone know? Yes, yes, it is? Okay. So ask yourself, 
What would Google do with the health information exchange? They wouldn't be just exchanging MRI results, okay? Google knows what I'm gonna ask before I ask it. That's how it works, I find it amazing. What would happen again if we just, in the process of our normal work, if we began to integrate into our, our health information exchanges some of that information? You know, if you knew what the graduate, high school graduation rate in the community where your, where your uh, 10 year old patient came from, that may help you decide on what to do uh, with that patient and what, what priorities to place on reading, et cetera. So I think even within healthcare and within the Affordable Care Act, if we try to transform how we practice medicine, we can bring to bear more community health workers, we can bring to bear more, quote, consumer input into how we structure things, how we, how we set up uh, uh, institutions, hospitals, health centers, et cetera. So there are things we can do on the ground. Now, that alone is not gonna help, but you have to also address the international and, and uh, international policy issues, and those are policy discussions. Not everybody will enjoy those discussions. Not everybody has to work on that level, but to, collectively, we all have to work on that level. So if you're more comfortable working at your local uh, school, fine. Uh, if you are comfortable working at the state level and dealing with those knuckleheads in Springfield, you have to have a strong stomach, and, uh, but, but we need that too. So I, I think there are things that people can do every day. They shouldn't be intimidated. Thanks very much, Dr. Murray. This was, uh, is this on? Yeah. Um, this was really interesting. Um, first of all, I have a comment that I am a healthcare activist for single payer healthcare and anybody who wants to get involved in that. We work on policy and we work on uh, access issues locally and at the state level. I'd be happy to talk to you. My questions are um, some of the environmental issues that have been in the news recently, and you mentioned that are the large number of Chicago public school or Chicago school children who have elevated lead levels, something like one in 10 to one in 12, um, the, the possibility of a, an expansion of the freight depot in the, uh, the um, Englewood area, the pet coke storage area. What, um, what obstacles are there to our public health departments to dealing with those issues and what are people doing regardless of the obstacles? What are our public health departments, such as they are in this country, doing with those issues? Actually, this is a great uh, example and a great question. First, let me just say, we have to work on all the levels. So what's happened in the past 30 years is that most people think only in this area of the national level, when in fact, local health departments have more authority to impact lead levels uh, than, than the state or national uh, in most locations. So one thing is, you never, you can't just work in one area and not another. You have to work on all the levels. Lead is a great example. When I was in medical school, uh, our concept of lead poisoning was, you know, it had to be 50 micrograms. The kids had to be seizing. Now we are clear that we have cognitive impairment and what we used to consider normal levels. So our notion, our scientific understanding of lead poisoning in children has profoundly changed as it has our tools for both treating it and also preventing it. But in most of the public's mind, lead is an old problem that we've, we've solved. So, th so that's one of the issues. It has to do with explaining clearly uh, what's really going on and how our understanding of lead has changed. And you know, many pediatricians in this country, especially older pediatricians, they don't consider lead a problem any longer, even though, as you say, it, it, it is a, a significant problem. So again, it means bringing to bear the expertise that we have as clinicians and physicians and nurses and engineers or whatever, and speaking plainly and clearly. Um, so environmental has a major impact on people's health. Most people don't know very much about it. Most public health people and clinicians don't know very much about it either. And it does mean the boogeyman of possibly regulating company. I mean, that's what it means. You have to make a decision that I don't have a personal right to file the air and water just so I can make money. That's a decision that, that has to be made. Uh, and if we're not willing to make that decision, then we'll continue to have 12 or 15% of the kids in Chicago public schools with elevated lead levels. It's criminal. Thank you so much for that uh, presentation. About two weeks ago, the Chicago Council on uh, Global Affairs had uh, a three-day workshop on the role of universities in urban development, urban health, because if you look at the problem of uh, 
urbanization. It's a global problem that everybody is going to have to deal with in the next uh, 20, 25 years. And uh, one of the key factors uh, that came up out of that uh, workshop that actually included the uh, presidents of the University of Chicago, Northwestern, and uh, University of Illinois, as well as presidents of other universities from about 30 to 40 different countries, um, is the need to figure out a way to work with government uh, so that some of the work that we do as academics can have uh, meaningful extension into the uh, community. Um, uh, do you have any suggestions or advice to us, to those of us who are in academics who have uh, interest in uh, what goes around uh, in our community, how we can more meaningfully engage with some of these uh, politicians that we try to stay away from? So, if I could do one thing, I wouldn't do just one thing. If I could do one thing, I would change the tenure process. I would make a third of your tenure based on research, scholarly research that one produces. I would have a third of your tenure decision based on your ability to transfer knowledge to teach. And I would have a third of your tenure based on what service you did to the community. Okay. So if I could pick one thing, that would immediately redirect people's attention, at least, uh, in those other two areas that often get overlooked, teaching and, and service. Uh, in a more uh, direct way, I, I think that, um, again, most academicians and scholars I know, they're expert in, in a relatively narrow area, and they really may not be expert in the communities that, that they're around, or even the communities that are impacted by their research. Uh, and so one of the things that means is that we have to work across disciplines. You know, so we have to, you know, it helps if, if, you, uh, if you're an environmental expert, for example, you may know nothing about the history of Chicago or the history of Pilsen or any other community that may have lead exposure. That means you may have to hook up with a historian and a sociologist and an anthropologist and all the other dis disciplines so that you have a better understanding about the human beings that are living in the communities that you may be studying lead levels or, or other uh, problems in. Um, so when we do that, when we come together across our academic disciplines and when we engage the world, that's what, really what you're talking about, when we engage the world, then dealing with the politicians becomes much easier. I think what happens too often as Americans, we go straight to dealing with the politicians. And the politicians are elected and influenced. We, we should deal with the people and the politicians. Okay. So when we have a better understanding of the communities that we're working with, then we learn all different kind of ways of working. Um, and and I, I think that uh, certainly in public health, uh, this concept of working with communities and doing research with communities is also true in, in occupational health and safety, my other area. Is, is something that's valued. And, and you will learn something different if you work with the people that are actually impacted with the problem. Um, so I don't think we should be afraid to embrace the world. We'll make mistakes, but we make mistakes in the laboratory also. There were some other questions. Hi, thank you so much. I'm always inspired by your talks. Um, in your role at Cook County, could you talk a little bit more about two things? One, um, in your leadership role, how you've been able to think about some of these larger, larger broader social issues and how you've been able to successfully or some of the challenges you've had integrate those into the, the kind of clinical medical practices in which you work. Um, and then the other is just how Cook County is positioning itself and readying itself for the changes that are coming in January and how it's partnering with other health institutions to try and sort of think about a lot of the patients at Cook County who will now have access to health insurance. Well, let me, let me answer the first the last part of your question first. Um, if you go to Massachusetts and you look at the status of our public safety net hospitals there, you will not find a pretty picture. It, it, is, it is a real strain, has been, and I think Massachusetts is one of the more successful places that we'll be lucky if the rest of the country looks like Massachusetts in 10 years. Um, so, so that's the first thing. So. Um, I, I think that um, the plans at the moment of the system to become, uh, in essence, a managed care entity and provide care and, and meet that triple aim stuff, um, I think we have to be really careful about the likelihood that that's going to happen. Um, so there'll be a half a million, a little over a half a million uninsured people in the county of Cook. 
if everything works perfectly. Well, we know everything's not going to work perfectly. Those people will disproportionately fall on the public sector, the VA system, U of I, and county. And at the moment, there is no structural way, because, because we don't think those people deserve health care, and we don't think they deserve to live, is what we're basically saying. There's no structural way to provide care for them. That's going to put a strain on, the, on all the safety net, not just the public sector safety net, but other safety net hospitals that have, for a long time, uh, really addressed this mission of people without insurance. Um, so we haven't solved the problem. The Affordable Care Act doesn't do that. Uh, and simply because community health centers or hospitals gear up to get paid for what they can do, doesn't by itself eliminate the problem. Now to the real question you asked at the very beginning is how do you, how do you integrate these broad issues with what you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, sometimes you can't do it on the job. It depends on what year in county you're talking about. Sometimes, sometimes we can start a project brotherhood at, in the county system and, and make inroads and other times we have trouble with it. I will say this, we can do it every day in our lives. So, so sometimes you may be able to do it as part and parcel of the University of Chicago's mission. Sometimes you may have to do it in the evening in a free clinic. Okay, so, so I don't want to discount that. But I do think we have to get our institutions to ask ourselves, what do we as an institution owe to the communities that we sit in? So this, this institution sits in my community. And then I will tell you, I think that the institution has gained from being in this community. Uh, and I think the institution owes the community, not just, uh, certainly not Harper Court. What a horrible thing. But <laughs> it's horrible architecture. I don't know what happened to the architecture for that horrible building. But anyway, uh, not, not just in things like that, but also in what, what health issues should we be looking at? You know, What challenges should the university, not just the medical component of the university, what challenges should the university be doing? So for example, the university has, has done a lot of work around research for education, and, and K through 12 education. How do we translate that? You know, what's going on in the charter schools that the university runs? Is it, things going well or not well? Are they transparent or not transparent? So I think at every point we can push the institutions that we work in, that we're part of, whether it's a faith-based institution, uh, whether it's a, a, a neighborhood club, we need to push people to really ask ourselves, are we doing what we need to do to make our health better and the health of our communities, our neighbors, our friends better? When we ask that question and when we strive to do that, then we find that we're able to make major changes in this country. I'm not sure these are working. You've spoken very eloquently and compellingly. At a couple points, you mentioned um, some differences in terms of the countries that are clearly outperforming us in terms of health and health outcomes, morbidity, mortality, and so forth. You've mentioned some of the differences, maybe difference in worldview, difference in view of the role of public health. Are there other differences in terms of the thought process that seems to be prevalent in those countries that might help inform us as to how to do better, including things such as general level of awareness on the part of the population of how they can improve health and taking of responsibility for that. Are there some lessons for us there? I, I don't think they're easy lessons, and I don't want to gloss over the sophistication of this particular review. These countries are not all Western, European, social welfare-based social democratic countries. You have conservative countries. You have countries that are relatively poor that have been coming up like Turkey. You have countries with a very different culture and history like Japan. So it, it's really, a, the, the, I think the, the frightening thing, if, if you'll let me be judgmental for a moment, is that we have such a wide divergent kind of nations that are doing better than us that we should really, really be scared, I guess is what I want to say. So I, I obviously have, I'm sure you've been able to pick up, I have my personal bias on the kinds of things I think we should do, but I think it's possible to have major improvements in health with a different political outlook, as, as these countries demonstrate. So I don't think it's just one political system, one you know, set of policies per se that do it. I will say, I, so having said that, I will say this, I think that those nations that invest in their young 
have been able to show major improvements. Okay, that whatever, whatever, that where they make real investments in their young people, in their health, in their education, in their recreation, uh, even if they're relatively poor countries, have made major improvements in the, in the, in the health of their children, and that leads on into adulthood. Um, and we have to really ask ourselves, as we appear to be disinvesting in our youth relative to previous decades, what does that mean for the future? Uh, in another 10, 15, 20 years, uh, then we may see that gap that we haven't seen, you know, that we saw narrowing among the seniors that may begin to grow as those people uh, age. So I don't think it's a simple answer. I would say if we simply begin to address this question and face up to it and make people aware that there's a gap, and it's a worsening gap. The gap was not always there, that we have a worsening gap compared to our peer nations. Here's a question here in the middle. Maybe if you shout, I don't know if they're trying to record, but I certainly do think Americans will respond to the notion that we're not number one, I agree. Uh, but I also have a little more faith in, in, in the people of the country, perhaps, uh, on my good days. Um, I, I really think this is, a, this is a country, if you excuse me for being clinical for a moment, that's a little bit schizophrenic. So we, so we have this, these American values, individualism, but we also have some other American values of solidarity, of justice, of fairness. Um, and, and the problem we have is getting, the infor getting information on the table so we can have a real discussion about what we want to do as a people. When we get the information on the table, when people, when people realize that they can't keep the government out of their Medicare program, <laughs> it's hard to have a debate with it. You know, once they figure that out, then we can have a discussion about what priorities we should have and what choices we should have. Um, and, and I found, um, no matter where I am in the country, as a, as a blatant, red, flaming socialist, I found that if, if I can talk to people about what's going on in their neighborhood, in their backyard, in the farm down the road, and why that old lady that worked that farm forever still should be able to get her diabetes medicine, that we really can have a real conversation and, and, and that we have a lot of commonality. It's when we go to the talking heads on TV and we sort of obscure the information and people aren't aware of what's going on that, uh, that it's harder to have a conversation. We don't, we don't agree on everything, but, it, but at least we can have a conversation about what's feasible. So I certainly hope that if we take this kind of information and we start talking about it at you know, Thanksgiving tables and you know, Christmas dinners and all of these other settings so that Americans begin to be aware of how behind we are in this and so many other areas, that we will stir up the competitive juices and we will begin to have the kind of discussions we need to have. Well, thank you all for your patience and interest.